Well, Dr. Olivia, I'm so over the moon that Happy Place Books is publishing the Instant Mood Fix. I'm over the moon about it. I am so excited to be working with Happy Place on this and can't wait to see where it's going to go. I'm, it's just, you know, such a crazy journey from the beginning of when I started writing my book to now and doing this podcast with you. So it's amazing. It's brilliant. And I'm, I'm, I'm just excited for people to read it because it's going to help in so many ways because it's so practical and, and I'll get to, to that in a moment but first of all let's talk about you a little bit first. So you're a mental health researcher at Cambridge University um, and you've got this you know 10 years of experience and research and I'm, I'm sure the answer to this is pretty obvious but over the last 12 months what impact have you seen on you know just general mental health in in the UK? The impact has been tremendous. You know, this pandemic has been so difficult for everybody to go through. Anxiety and depression have been widespread. There has been this sense of hopelessness that has ensnared the world and people not knowing what's going to happen, futures with their jobs, you know, people coming in and out of furloughs. It's, it's been so, so difficult. And now as restrictions are easing and we're slowly getting back to normal, you know, it's it's definitely something that is giving us a sense of optimism, but we are still feeling those mental health effects that we've been feeling for the past year, very much so. Yeah, I guess we're still trying to make sense of it, and a lot of it you can't. So there's still that element of not being able to really kind of, you know, sit there and get your, your ducks in a row and go, right, what just happened to me? How am I going to move on from this? No matter what your circumstances, it's been just so globally weird for us all. And, you know, this is where I think your book is going to help so many people, because throughout your years of research, you've identified 10 different thought patterns or bad moods, essentially, that are holding people back, that are detrimental to our well-being, our enjoyment of life. And then the book consists of all these brilliant, very practical breakdowns of, of how we can move through them, um, because I think sometimes I guess through you know the modern world projecting so much perfection at us sometimes we might have this subconscious belief that we can just eradicate bad moods that we we should be able to live without them being around and that is obviously impossible we're going to in the most sort of you know human way react to whatever's going on around us so this book is i guess more about accepting them and then learning to move through them is that correct yeah, yeah, exactly. Just it's about being kind with ourselves. And, you know, the moods that I'm talking about in the book, they're so common. I mean, it's something that, you know, people experience could be on a daily basis, could be, you know, for example, indecision or procrastination, procrastination, something that students are struggling with all the time. Um, feeling like you're out of control in life is something that people in this pandemic have been experiencing, this, this uh, sense of control that has been missing. And, and, you know, so many other things that I've been looking at, like uh, dealing with breakups and feeling rejected. So really looking at these situations, at these moods, and how can we cope with them? And I've been looking at the science and, you know, for 10 years, I've been looking at how we can help people thrive in life and overcome these moods. How can you become a more decisive person, a more optimistic person? And, you know, like you said, it, it starts with being kind with yourself and doing some of the coping strategies, practicing them as often as you can to become the person that you want to be. Because if I can just add my, it is my firm belief that no matter where you are at in life, what your journey has been, no matter what your age, you can make the decision today to lead a different life and, and to practice new coping strategies. I know sometimes I think we get stuck in the thought like that's not possible. I am just the sort of person that is anxious. I'm just the sort of person that is stressed out. And it's empowering to know that's not the case. I mean, how much of this is habitual? How, looking at that list of 10, how many of those bad moods are just habit that we fall into it because it's familiar? Exactly. You know, so many of these, so many of these moods are habit. The thing is, if we're looking at procrastination, you know, it's something that for a lot of people, they habitually approach tasks with this procrastination mindset, if you will, you know, it, it's become a habit. So every time they're faced with a new task, 
they're tempted to delay, but it's something that you can overcome. And in the book, I talk about simple, actionable strategies that you can take to overcome procrastination. Because really, procrastination is nothing more, for example, than just wanting to get away from uncomfortable feelings. You're faced with a task, you're feeling frustrated, you're feeling bored, and you want to run away from it. You want to feel good in the moment, but that can come at a cost, you know, the cost of your long-term goals and dreams. So, um, yeah, can we just can we just go back to your original question? Because sometimes I tend to... <laughs> No, that's good. Tangents, tangents, so I lose. <laughs> tangents are so welcome on this podcast this podcast is essentially tangents that's all it is um well I guess it's let's 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 list the 10 so we can just break them down because I want to talk about some of the the practical tips around it so we've got um the feeling of indecisiveness which you've talked about the, mm-hmm. the feeling of being unmotivated the feeling of overwhelm feeling lonely feeling low feeling out of control feeling stressed anxious, rejected, and let down. So uh, can all of those fall into the category of occasionally being bad habits or nearly all of the time being bad habits rather than it's just inbuilt in us? It depends. It depends because the way that we approach things, whether we're indecisive, whether we are feeling out of control, it can be determined by so many factors. For example, how you've been raised, how your parents have been, because we model and copy a lot of our behaviors from our parents. So for example, if we see them reacting with fear or anxiety towards certain situations, you know, like even seeing a spider, if our mother was very fearful of spiders, arachnophobia, we're more likely to adopt that anxiety. And also our past experiences. Yeah, and also our past experiences, you know, if we've been trauma in the past, if we've uh, dealt with physical or sexual abuse, then that as well can affect our mindset and, and ourselves and our mental health, you know, for a long time. But also the thing to remember is, you know, when we're looking at just common everyday moods and, and people wanting to overcome these moods and wanting to become more confident or, um, or extroverted, whatever that may be, it is important to remember that these aspects are not something you're born with. Nobody's born charming. Nobody's born confident. <laughs> <laughs> it's something that you can develop. It's a skill that you can develop with practice. And I think that's really helpful. Well, it is. It's liberating because you don't feel like you're bound to them for your whole life. You know, I think I've definitely dealt with anxiety over the last, you know, 10 years. And I, I know the root of it and I can see that. But I think when I'm not feeling great, I will assume that's it. That's me for life. I'm just going to always react to certain situations with heightened anxiety. And it's nice to to know, like you just said there, you know, practicing whatever it is, you know, practicing to be more charming, charismatic or skilled at something. You know, you can practice and get better at it. And it's the same with lessening the these sort of the reaction to these 10 bad moods and and it's such a lovely book because not only is it insanely practical but also you marry your 10 years of research with also talking about your own life at times because you mentioned in the book that your mum's cancer returned last year and obviously then you were met with certain feelings and and moods that you're actually there researching is it possible in those moments to look at your own reactions and and your own life and actually, you know, use your own tips and use your own advice to, to navigate something as, as sort of serious and painful as that? It is. And I do this all the time. It's actually, you know, a while back when I did a TED talk on loneliness, this was the question that I was asked at the very end of my talk. Do you ever use your coping strategy? And I do. In so many situations, you know, and when it comes to what I experienced in life and my mother's illness, it was something very difficult to go through and something that is still very much affecting me. And, you know, something that I talk about in the book is this concept of post-traumatic growth. Basically, whenever we're faced with something truly difficult in life, whether that's an illness in the family or maybe you're experiencing an illness or, um, I mean, the listeners, you know, or a devastating financial situation or a breakup, 
Usually we tend to hear about how bad that is and how we spiral downwards and develop depression and anxiety. And while there's no doubt that that can happen and such situations are incredibly difficult to go through, we also can develop this post-traumatic growth at the same time. So at the same time that we're suffering, we can also develop this growth and distress and growth can co-occur. And you know what is happening in this growth phase, this post-traumatic growth is that we're developing this new appreciation for life. We're deepening our bonds with other people. We're starting to not take life for granted anymore. And that was exactly happening to me. You know, I remember, I remember there were those days when I had found out that her cancer had come back, that I was just feeling numb and in disbelief that this was all happening. And, and I felt like I needed people more than I ever did in my life. And, you know, the smallest interactions that I had with people, it felt like I was creating bonds and it was almost like this closer bond that I was feeling to the world. And, um, and it changed me in so many ways. I, I started thinking about how grateful I am to still have her in my life and how I wanted to make the most of the moments that I had, that I have with her right now. And she's feeling the same thing, you know, after, after uh, my mother told me that, of course, the first few months of finding out that her cancer came back as a metastasis, she was traumatized. But after some time had passed, she realized that, you know, she was just going to enjoy every day as it came and neither hope or sorry, not hope, but neither cling uh, to this desperate hope of prolonging her life. You know, there was no desperation, just this quietness and acceptance of what she was dealing with, accepting life and enjoying each day as it came. And I think when people are going through very difficult situations, it's important to remember that we're also growing and becoming a stronger version of ourselves. Yeah, well, so much love to your incredible mom. I mean, what resilience. And it's so interesting to hear you say, I don't think I've ever heard that before, that, you know, we can have distress yet, you know, real optimistic growth at the same time, positive growth. And of course, you know, I, I've experienced that myself going through things that felt incredibly traumatic at the time, but I could also, I was sort of witnessing myself moving into a new phase of life and it was very, very slow, don't get me wrong. I feel like really only in the last six months, maybe a year, but probably less, I'm really moving into a new era of life now where after 10 years of sort of growing and not feeling quite great or quite right or on the right sort of course of life that I'm now you know I'm moving into a new phase where the the negatives are less and actually the growth bit seems to be expanding more and it's really exciting but it's it's good to be able to witness that because I think sometimes we just categorize things like this is an awful time everything's awful there's nothing there's no point to it Whereas actually mm -hmm. seeing real growth and, and resilience come from a tough place, I think could be the thing that helps you get through it at the end of the day. Um, I would love to work through a few of the, the brilliant things that you say in the book, stuff that I've written down whilst reading it. I've made so many notes so I could remember them and, and put them into practice. And I'd love to start with indecision because we all feel indecisive at times and we probably all know that we need to work with that gut reaction to, to save ourselves, you know, sleepless nights and all sorts of stress. But sometimes I feel like things are so clouded that my gut reaction is either forgotten or it feels like I didn't have one. Do we always ha have a gut reaction when we're making a decision? When it comes to a complicated decision, a complex decision, for example, which furniture or car to buy, if you're feeling that inner whisper within you, just this kick in the gut, something, something small, then go with that. 
Are, do we always get that? It depends. It depends on the circumstance. It depends on the situation. It depends on our mental health and state of well-being in that moment. So if our minds are clear, if we're feeling calm, then it's easier to hear these whispers within us, what our intuition is telling us. So it's, it's, it's imperative to get quiet so you can listen almost. And I don't mean listen with our ears, but listen to that inner voice. And, and you can't do that if you're distracting yourself constantly. Exactly. And that's why it's important to take time out in the day. I would suggest every day to just get away from technology, get away yeah. from social media and just take some time for yourself to get grounded, to listen to yourself. What does your body want? What do you need? And, you know, our, I think our intuition is so important because oftentimes it's what can guide us in life. And, you know, people sometimes try to, to, um, or not try to, but they don't listen to their intuition. Mm. Maybe friend is guiding them to go along this pathway or that way, or, you know, this other pathway, but our intuition, our gut instinct is never wrong, you know, and, and when you hear that quiet little voice within you, listen to it. And that can go for very simple things. Like you're working on a project and maybe you started an hour ago and now you don't feel like working anymore and you want to take a break. But what does that quiet little inner voice within you say? Should you continue working for another hour? Is it time for a break now? So just yeah. something to keep in mind. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you, there's this one brilliant line of advice which says, go for good enough instead of the best. Because of course, that is something that floors us. So often we think, no, no, I'm not gonna do this, you know, buy this, go on a date with this person, whatever it might be, because it's not the best, best, best available. But sometimes just going for the option that's good enough leads us onto a whole other beautiful tangent of life or opens our mind to something different. And actually looking for only the best or something that's sort of mythically perfect could potentially get us stuck. Is that right? Absolutely. The best doesn't exist. It's a yeah. mirage. You know, I call it a finish line that we're always aiming towards. We want newer and better gadgets, you know, better partners, better, 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 more, 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 but we can never reach it because that's how society is today. You know, newer and better gadgets are coming out all the time and it's just impossible, this relentless race. So, you know, there's a difference between the way people make decisions. Uh, some are called maximizers and these people try to find the best product, the best everything. And they spend a lot of time doing this and can, it can be really stressful and daunting. So for example, if you're going to a store um, or to a shop and you're looking for a shirt to buy, if you're a maximizer, you're tempted to try on as many shirts as possible, go to as many shops as possible until you finally decide on one. But then, like I said, this can be stressful and it can be really time consuming and it can make you quite unhappy in the end because you might never even find what you're looking for. The other type of decision maker is the satisfizer and this person goes by good enough. So they don't need to find the best product. They are just going by good enough. And if they look at a few options and they find something that meets their needs, then that's good enough for them. And you know, I believe that it can make us happier in life when, when we do that, when instead of going for the best, we go for good enough. And actually, it's funny because I remember um, when I started my PhD at the University of Cambridge, we were all in this room for this welcome reception, and they wanted to talk to us about our thesis, which is this document that you have to produce at the end of your PhD. And it's you know, this 40,000 word document. And we were all wondering, well, how good does it have to be? You know, it has to be like really, really good. So rigorous, so thorough. Otherwise, you know, um, it might not be what they're looking for. And I was so surprised to hear the person who was leading this event, the speaker, when he asked us, well, how good do you think a PhD this thesis ha has to be? And the answer was good enough. He told us it has to be good enough. And I got it. And it was such a simple advice, but something I took with me the entire time. 
It's such you good know. advice. It keeps us moving forward. Like not that we're trying to get yeah. it, but it just keeps movement in the picture rather than this stagnation because we can't make the decision because we're just not sure what's the best. You know, I think it's it's really, really valuable. Looking at motivation, there, there's a, in the motivation chapter, there's a, a similar sort of feeling to the line, do it badly. Which again, I love, you know, if you're feeling unmotivated, it's probably because, or one of the reasons might be because you think I'm going to do a bad job. I, I'm not, I'm, I'm too tired today. I'm going to do a bad job. And your advice is do it badly because at least you'll do it. Yeah, exactly. E exactly. And, and the thing is, a lot of people strive for perfection. They want to do their tasks perfectly. You know, they, um, can't start they feel like they can't start until it's the perfect time to begin until they've got all all this knowledge and all these resources but that slows us down it causes even more paralysis so just jump into it don't worry about how it's going to turn out do it badly and start out by doing it badly and of course you can come back to it later and refine what what you've been working on and the thing that I always hear from people tell me that you know people that have used this um this advice is that whatever they've done badly or in a rush or you know whatever they've done however when they looked back on that thing it actually wasn't that bad mm. they did it you know yeah and that's how you you know like if I look at my whole career I'm pretty sure the first 10 years were pretty bad but you know you just, at least you're doing it and you're learning and you're getting something done and again I think I probably had um I guess the benefit of when I started my career the whole notion of perfectionism wasn't really as sort of finely tuned as it is today so you could kind of get away with being a bit scruffy around the edges whereas now this notion again of perfectionism is just causing so many problems and it can be so deliberating so again I just think that's such great advice just do it do it badly whatever you're thinking right now god I haven't done this and I haven't I'm so behind on that just I have to do it with what I'm book writing like I'm knackered I don't know if I'm in the right headspace I'm just going to write and just see what happens and I'll go back and look at it later and as you say it's never as bad as you think it is anyway and then let's look yeah. at feeling out of control because this is something that we've all experienced in the last 12 months because we quite frankly haven't known and we still don't really know what the future holds I mean we don't ever really but it, that's been really magnified mm -hmm. this last 12 months because our lives have changed so much in in really you know sort of small and major ways um I have a bit of a problem with feeling out of control because I sort of crave safety all the time um and if i don't feel safe in a situation it could be something as really regular as going to sleep if i'm staying at a friend's house or we've stayed or we're staying in a hotel or whatever because it's unfamiliar i don't feel safe and therefore i feel completely out of control and that spirals me into catastrophizing and and all sorts of stuff so i think this one it's quite a complex subject because there's sort of that end of it but then also there's the actual being out of control when it comes to habits so say somebody who smokes and knows they don't really want to or drinks excessively or any other sort of harmful habit that you're in you know I'm sure we've all felt this at times we feel like the habits got us we have no control over this habit there's no way we could stop it's just it's overwhelming what advice would you give to somebody you know, who knows they've got a sort of a habit that's detrimental to them, but they feel out of control with? Mm. That's a complex issue because habits and, for example, you know, smoking or whatever it is for some people wanting to give up coffee, you know, um, it, it can be hard to break habits, but it isn't impossible and we can do it. And what I, what I would tell people is, to first of all you know i think i think quieting your mind is important for every situation that you may be struggling with because sometimes when we try to break a habit we start criticizing ourselves why haven't i done it why do i always go back to that so dropping the self criticism quieting your mind and just giving yourself a chance to show yourself that you can break it and to take it one step at a time you don't have to 
give everything up at once, you know, start small. So for example, if you're trying to give up coffee, then reduce the amount by a little bit, you know, and keep reducing it. Don't give it up cold turkey. It's important to be kind with ourselves and gentle. You know, that goes a long way towards our mental health and well being. And just a practical piece of advice, something that, that can really help when it comes to not giving into temptation, whether that's, you know, a certain snack that you want to avoid, like crisps or chocolate you know, or caffeine, again, is to keep these things out of your line of vision. So take them out of your environment, because when we don't have them around us, it's easier, you know, instead of us using all of our motivation and willpower to control ourselves to not give in, it's much easier if we change our environment so that the environment now supports us. So much easier. So, um, yeah, I think people should give that a try and, and see how it works for them. I I had it recently. Now you just mentioned chocolate. I love chocolate a lot. And um, I've got this really amazing vegan chocolate at home. And I got into, again, the habit over a long period of time. I'm talking like probably a year, probably since the pandemic started, actually, where I felt like I had to have like not a huge amount, but a bit of chocolate after every meal that I'd eaten, like well, lunch and dinner, not after breakfast. And then like about two, three weeks ago, I thought, why am I doing that? Like, what is that about? I don't have to have that after lunch and after dinner. And I don't think it's making me feel great because it is obviously like a load of sugar in it. So I just I did go cold turkey. I went, that's got to stop, like not forever, but I'm just going to experiment and see. And after about 10 days I felt so like such a boost of confidence like oh my god just doing that represents so much because I could do that in so many areas of my life whether it comes to confidence or trying something new at work like it's just about giving it a go so I think it's actually really confidence boosting weirdly as well absolutely and you know I love that you said that it made you feel more in control about other areas of your life because yeah. the more we try, yeah, the more that we try to, for example, not give in to having that chocolate or not having that cup of coffee, we're building our self-control. The more you flex your self-control muscles, the stronger your control muscles, and it starts to spill over into other areas of your life. So this is something for everyone to try. Yeah. Go uh, start doing something for two weeks. So that's, yeah, what were you going to say, Fern? No, I was going to say, so the two so, weeks, like that's, that's, yeah. that's the period of time that it takes to break a habit, right? Is it about two weeks, three weeks where you've done it for that long? You can, you can rewire your brain to, to start new positive habits. Exactly. It takes three weeks to form a habit and, and practice doing something in those three weeks, you know, whether that's going for a walk every day or whatever it is. And you'll see that not only you self control that one aspect that you're trying to change, for example, not giving into that piece of chocolate, but this increased self-control will spill over. So you might find that, oh, now you're finding it easier to work on that project in the evening or something that you're putting off. Yeah, it's so confidence boosting. And, and then let's look at overwhelm, because again, I think it, it's sort of you know, it's um, again something that we've just all had to deal with in the last 12 months. And but not only the last 12 months, because, you know, the modern world we live in now, we are bombarded with information. We are bombarded with imagery. We're, it's just a bombardment constantly, mainly because we have a phone, you know, close to us literally all day long, if not another type of screen. And your advice in terms of overwhelm is to look at how much we let into our minds, you know, to sort of, I guess, have a bit of a, a clear out, have a little bit of a declutter of the mind to, to stop yourself feeling overwhelmed. Because I think we, again, have normalized the amount of information that we're imbibing these days. We're like, oh, it's just regular to be looking at a phone all day, to then maybe read a newspaper, to watch the news, to then see something on the internet, to then watch something on YouTube. We've normalized that amount of information in a day. So do you think a lot of overwhelm sort of lies in the hands of technology and, and how much we're sort of just filling our brains with daily. 
I do. I do. And it's one of the things that can get in the way of our motivation and make us not be able to give our full attention to tasks because, you know, and it happens to all of us, say the day is starting and you're getting emails and then your WhatsApp is pinging and you're getting a phone call and then, you know, you're getting more emails and Zoom calls and all of this is crowding out your brain space. It's cluttering your mind. And actually, I remember reading a while back that today we are exposed to 300 information outside of work compared to 30 years ago. Wow. That's huge. Imagine what this does to our mental health. I know. And we've just made it, you know, no, we've not only made it normal, we've made it a must. Like if you're not on top of everything, you know, like what Rihanna had for her lunch versus what's happening the other side of the planet, in a political sense that we're somehow, you know, ignorant or not keeping up to date. And it's like, that's not normal to know all of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And we have to take care of ourselves and our well-being. You know, we keep everything that's happening. We, (laughs) it's important to dedicate some time in the day to reading the news and spend say 30 minutes and then just focus And also the other thing I would say at the beginning of each day to dedicate two hours to deep work. And this can help you get so much more done. So what this means is during those two hours, it's distraction free, free of all technology. You're shutting off technology. You're not checking emails, you know, because otherwise if we don't do that, it's so easy to allow all of this other stuff to get in the emails, the text messages you know, and to get anything done. I mean, it's, it's happened to all of us um, at one time or another. And at the end of the day, what do we do? Besides ourselves for not having done what we wanted to do in the first place. And then the cycle of the pizza itself. So we have to impose limits. Yeah. That's it. I think sometimes like it can sound on, you know, like it's, it's not achievable. Like, oh my God, two hours without looking on my phone. But of course, we all managed before, you know, I didn't have a phone till I was probably about 15 and I would still meet up with other people. I would still, you know, be able to go about my business and travel around or even go on holiday to other countries. You know, we, we think that they're the be all and end all and that we have to have this information constantly, but it's such a good idea for our mental health and so many other parts of our lives to really, I mean, does it boil down to discipline? Is that what it is really? It's partly if you're not, you know, if someone listening is not a disciplined person, then you can build that by flexing the self-control muscle. So starting small, okay, you can't do two hours, do one hour distraction-free and do a, a task that is important for you during that time that will make you feel like you're progressing in life and then do everything else. So that's one of the things. And then what you were saying about you know, before you didn't have phones and everybody still managed perfectly fine. You know, that is very true. And also for looking at the statistics, anxiety and depression have increased. We're more depressed and anxious than ever. We're lonelier than ever. And you would think that with all of this social media, we'd be more connected than ever. But if you look at the UK, one in six people are lonely, you know, and it's gotten worse in the pandemic. Uh, you know, obviously, we, we know it's got worse in the pandemic. But outside of that, as you say, loneliness is huge. What is that disconnection about? Why are we so much more disconnected than ever before? Is it just a lack of, you know, a sense of community? Has that just dwindled over time? Sense of community, definitely. Before, people felt like they were a lot more embedded in their communities. You know, the question has shifted, the question for people. So, decades ago, the question would be, well, what can I do for other people? How can I help my community? How can I help my neighbor? What can I do for my parents? You know, thinking this, you know, having these thoughts about other people. The question has shifted as we become more individualistic, you know, the question has shifted to, well, what can I do for myself? Society has become increasingly competitive. And when you're thinking about well, what can I do f- for myself, then, you know, when, when we're thinking so much about 
ourselves, then kind of breaks down those social connections, that social fabric becomes more fragile. So then next time when we're hit with something really stressful, we can't fall back on our communities or on our neighbors as we once could. And the only person that we can fall back on really is ourselves now. And that can be really hard for one individual. Do you, and also social media. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, do you think we've become more individualistic and more competitive because we feel lacking? And, I'm, and I, I've, I've sort of come to that, you know, own personal conclusion with you just saying that because, you know, we are again bombarded with, well, essentially advertising that's telling us, you know, you could be better here, you could look better, you could probably look like these cool people in this picture and social media exasperates that as well. And because we feel lacking, we're more desperate to try and get somewhere, feel better, get ahead. Do you think it's rooted in that sense of lacking? I do, because with this social media around us, then we are comparing ourselves to everyone and everything that we're seeing. So before when phones didn't, you know, there was no smartphone, when we didn't have all of this social media, the people that we would compare ourselves would be those in our close environment. So our parents, friends, teachers, you know, people in your, people in your neighborhood. But now as we're getting access to everyone all over the world, we are potentially comparing ourselves to to everyone, you know, and, and the other thing to remember is that on social media, people tend to post the highlight reels of their lives, you know, the rosy pictures, the wonderful holidays they've had, the great job that they've just been offered, not the downsides, not what is going wrong in their lives. And when we see that, it can make us feel like we're lacking and it can take us into depression. I mean, totally. It's, um, we all kind of know this weird myth, but we still fall for it. We still look at it and think, oh God, I'm missing out or I'm not, you know, doing as well as others or whatever. It's why I feel compelled to often show it the other side. So, I mean, last night I quite happily posted a picture of me sat next to my broken washing machine, which in our house is literally the worst thing that could possibly break. Like the pile of laundry I have downstairs at the moment is making my toes curl I actually can't think about it it's going to stress me out um well actually we should we should talk about stress because stress is something <laughs> that we again it, it comes hand in hand with the velocity that we're living at you know this crazy fast-paced life we're trying to keep up with it we're chasing our tails we perhaps some of us had a small hiatus from that during the pandemic not everybody but some did get the chance to perhaps go, God, wow, I was living at quite a speed and I don't know if I wanna go back to that. I'm, I'm definitely one of those people. But stress is kind of embedded in everyday life these days because we're trying to do so much. And you know, maybe as parents, like we're trying to get our kids to school on time, have they done their homework? And we constantly feel like we're, oh my God, we're chasing it. And it brings this undue stress you know, upon all of us. Why do you think that, it, and it, you know, it has got worse over the years and perhaps living conditions are better than they've ever been. We are essentially more connected to others via technology if we need to be. You know, why is stress such a problem today? Because we're multitasking, because now, especially women, you know, yeah. putting down a job, taking care of children, uh, taking care of elderly parents or relatives, doing so much. And we're living these multitasking, fast paced lifestyles, which is making us feel burned out. And, you know, it, it can feel like it's hard to keep up at times. So it's important to, in those moments, to just take some time to, to breathe, really. You know, in the middle of the hurricane, when everything's spinning around you, to just take some time to close your eyes and to breathe and center yourself and try to let go of thoughts. And if they come back and just focus on your breath, that is so calming. You know, it's, it's something that I do when I feel really stressed out is I'll just close my eyes, sit on a chair and focus on my breath going in and out. And if a thought comes into my mind, then I just gently release it. I don't, I try not to feed it with energy. And, um, you know, I think that's an important, an important step. And then just doing, 
you know, actually going back to, um, I remember last weekend, another experience that I had last winter, there was a time when I was really stressed. I had so many things going on. And what I felt at one point was that I was so stressed and I had so much going on that I couldn't do anything anymore. I just couldn't take the first step with anything anymore. You know, it's like, should I do this? Should I do that? Should I do that? You know, it's almost like I was spending more time thinking about what I should get started with than actually starting something. Yeah, I've so been there. I've so been. And, yeah. and it's part of that because there's this other weird new concept that, that's come into play more recently where we celebrate busyness. So if you call your mate and you say, oh, how are you? They go, oh, my God, I'm so busy. And <laughs> if you were to call yeah. them and, and they said, oh, I'm not really doing anything that, you know, that would be a weird thing to reply with. You know, I would celebrate that idleness because my yeah. goodness, we all know that that stillness is where we can just really enjoy what's going on around us. But it's seen as like lazy or you're not trying or whatever and it's like oh my god we've it's so warped how we look at life mm -hmm. now like oh my god well done for being so busy like poor you it's so amazing whereas wouldn't it be lovely to go you know what I'm really not doing very much and it's really great like mm -hmm. whoever says that yeah no it's true it's true yeah we need to Definitely. so rewrite that one like massively and le okay let's talk about anxiety this is I think probably the number one subject at the moment for everybody. You know, when I've been looking around me at my friends' kids who are teenagers, I'm terrified. I'm terrified at the levels of anxiety. You know, when I was a teenager, I don't think I had any at all. I was just getting drunk, snogging boys. That's all I cared about. Whereas there's this anxiety for teenagers now. And, it, and honestly, it's, it's literally every one of my friends' teenagers is experiencing this in really extreme ways. You know, some have started therapy, um, some are, you know, just reaching out and talking to people they think might be able to help. Um, but it, it's a, such a big problem. I mean, again, not to put too much blame on it, but is technology the culprit here? Mm. Yeah, part of it, partly, because again, when, when, um, when we're on, using technology all the time, and especially children who are growing and developing, then that can interfere with their sleep. It can increase their anxiety levels. Um, especially, you know, I mean, I've heard that some kids will wake up in the middle of the night because they can't wait to check if they got an Instagram message or a Facebook message. And um, so social media and again this comparison with other people and seeing other people's rosy pictures and highlight reels of their lives can affect your mental health as a child and also as an adult you know this constant comparison but also this uh just these multitasking lifestyles that we now have and so much has changed in society so much has changed and we're trying to keep up you know i mean if we're looking at the pandemic, for example, a lot of people started working from home and uh, Zoom calls became the new way of having meetings. So trying to keep up with another change, you know, and if somebody wasn't really used to technology as much, then they had to readjust during the pandemic. And that's just one example, but you know, I believe that society is changing at a much higher, much faster pace now than it's ever been. And this is affecting us. Mm. And, and you say that one of the tools that we can use in moments of anxiety is optimism. And some might assume that you're either an optimistic person or not. But your advice seems to allude to the fact that this is, again, something you can cultivate with perhaps practice. Yes. When, when people are feeling anxious, they might be feeling a little bit out of control or restless or fearful. And something that can help that can be an antidote to these negative feelings is cultivating positive emotion. When we have positive emotion, we, we tend to have access to a greater repertoire of thoughts and actions that we can take. So it's almost like we get more ideas as to what we could do. You know, what course of action we could take, we become more resourceful. So for that reason, it's important to, to practice putting ourselves in 
in a more optimistic state. And also for looking at optimists, they tend to have this belief that they're in charge of their lives. They can direct their lives in the way that they want to. And by contrast, people who are pessimistic don't have this belief. You know, they might think that uh, maybe um, if something happens to them that isn't good, that it's, um, sorry, is, is it going to be possible to edit? <laughs> yeah, of course. You can okay. edit anything you like. Okay, good. Because, um, yeah. So just um, want to get my thoughts in order, but yeah, so I'll just go back to the optimism piece. When, when, we, when we become more optimistic, then we tend to feel like we're more in charge of our lives, you know, and, and when people feel like they're more in charge of their lives, then they become happier because they um, are more likely to engage in things that are within their control. Is this where hope and faith comes into play as well? Because you talk about it in the chapter about feeling let down, that that's, that's our opportunity to look at faith and hope. And again, outside of a religious framework, that might feel alien to some people, like what? I can have faith in life, I can have hope in life. And really that is a choice, isn't it? We can choose to go, you know what? I'm gonna be optimistic, I'm gonna be hopeful, or I'm gonna walk down the road that I've been down so many times, which leads to me feeling let down again, or feeling anxious or any of the negative emotions that we've really talked through. Yeah, religion and spirituality, there's something that can help us that can bring that sense of hope when we're going through a tough time, when we have anxiety, or when we're dealing with a really difficult, traumatic situation. And it's something that a lot of people around the world turn to, you know, especially in moments of crisis. It it can be like that, you know, sometimes that last branch of hope that you can cling to. For example, if you're dealing with an uncontrollable situation, you've been in a car accident and there's nothing else that you can do about it now or something has happened to you, you know, which... Um, for example, an illness, you know, um, one of the things that can help you is to just, you know, just looking at reports of people that have experienced this, knowing that you can let go of things that are beyond your control. And what has helped some of these people is turning to a higher power for help, knowing that even if there's nothing else that you can do, a higher power is there to support you. And you know, a lot of research has looked at this and, and basically it's saying that we all have this support network to a greater or lesser degree, obviously, but made up of various people, for example, family, friends, coworkers, and God can be one of these members in our support network. Um, and spirituality is something that a lot of people also turn to, you know, whether that's mindfulness or meditation or yoga, just tapping into this sphere of spirituality, because sometimes we have these questions that we yearn to find an answer to, like, what's the point of life or what happens to us after we die? What is the point of my suffering? We want to find meaning in what we're going through. And spirituality can help us with that. Mm, without a doubt. I mean, it's been essential for me at times to, to surrender to that, essentially, to go, look, I don't know what to do here. I don't know how to feel in control here. So I'm handing it over. And, and I love that element of surrender. It is, it's a weight lifted. And, um, and something you just said there really struck a chord because that's right. So when we're looking at feeling low, again, you know, whether it is, the more severe end of the extreme of depression but just also everyday feelings of just being a bit low um one way to perhaps have faith and hope is to look for that silver lining and maybe it's really hard in the moment because you're in that suffering or you're in that pain or you're in that just funk but down the line there will be one and it and it might be hidden and it might be something that's not that obvious but i can see it in my own life you know after having a really shitty time of feeling very, very low and um, 
you know, a lot of the things that we've talked through today, anxiety, rejection, all, all of that sort of stuff. The, I mean, the massive silver lining for me is that I now get to do this work. I wouldn't be doing any of this if I hadn't been through that. And although there are still mm -hmm. hangovers for me where I have to deal with the stuff that came after it and also the feelings that I still, as a slight emotional hangover, get or I'm triggered by, the silver lining is so much bigger now. And, and that feeds into what you've just said about looking for meaning. Like so much of this, I feel, is about looking for meaning because... Otherwise, what's the point of these 10 feelings? There has to be a point to all of them, surely. Like, is there a point to anxiety? Is there a point to rejection? Is there a point to loneliness? Do we have to look for the meaning in all of these moods for us to learn to work through them? Looking for meaning is something that can help us get through many situations. Whatever situation you're going through, you know, it can, you know, here's a silly example no matter how ridiculous it may seem to you, think of the benefits of having gone through it, of having experienced it. And this can help you see things differently. It can change your perception and it can put you in a more resourceful state. So for example, the thing that is coming to me, um, the thing I have at the top of my mind right now is my mother's illness. Obviously this was the worst thing to have happen you know, and I would never want that. The positive way that it has changed me is that it made me feel a lot closer to the rest of the world. And it made me appreciate life in a way that I hadn't before. You know, I, I do not take it for granted anymore. And I cherish all the moments that I get to spend with my mother. You know, it has brought this closeness into my life. And it can go for small situations as well. Like, you know, why, um, if something didn't work out, like maybe you messed up a presentation at work, then what was good about that situation? Well, the good thing is maybe that now you know what to do next time to avoid it. You know, the lessons learned. Mm, it's, the, it's the lessons, isn't it? It's the lessons, but also like you say, the sort of, deep gratitude that you're feeling now which isn't to by any means lessen the, the pain and the, the difficulty of a situation like that but like you say putting some of your focus and energy onto the bit that you know has been positively game-changing for you is a way through it it's a way mm -hmm. to survive tough situations and I think because the pandemic has you know really exacerbated so many of these moods we've talked about today there are people out there who need these very very practical tips to survive them because some of them can be catastrophic and um debilitating and and life-changing in a detrimental way so it is it's about the movement isn't it it's about moving through things and not getting stuck and i think you know the message that i'm sort of getting from the book and chatting to you today is we don't have to be defined by any of these 10 because I'm sure that we'll all naturally lean into one or two of them more than others. Like for me, I'm lucky that I haven't felt too lonely in life. When I was on my own, I don't think I felt particularly lonely. And now, if anything, there's too many people in my house. Um, but then, you know, anxiety for me and overwhelm are huge and sort of daily factors that I have to deal with. But we can so easily think, oh, that's just who I am. I'm that's part of my personality, but actually we can liberate ourselves from that by going, no, I can do this stuff. And then mm -hmm. I don't have to be the person that's always gonna feel anxious when I'm doing X, Y, or Z or whatever. It's, um, it's liberating and I think it's, it's really game changing to understand how we can move through them. So, you know, thank you again for writing this brilliant book. I know that it's gonna help so many people out there and be a real tool book that people can dip in and out of when they know they're feeling that emotion they can go to it they can read the text that's right there to give them the advice to to get them through it so thank you so much and and thank you for talking thank you also today. thank you oh thank you for and i had such a great time doing this with you i really enjoyed the interview i really did mm -hmm.